Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Shore Community Church. My name's Jamie. I'm the minister here, and it's really lovely to welcome you here, even though the weather outside is frightful. But in here, it's quite delightful. But we don't want it to snow. We're going to begin our time together um, in a time of worship. If you feel uh, comfortable and able to stand, please stand with me as we sing these songs. If you'd rather sit, that's absolutely fine. Be free. Be at home. Enjoy the presence of God. Know that you are welcome. Know that you are loved in the presence of God. will rise as we wait upon the Lord we will wait upon the Lord we will wait upon the Lord strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord we will wait upon the Lord we will wait upon let's sing that again strength will rise strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord we will wait upon the Lord we will wait upon the Lord Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong We wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever, our hope, our strong
are my king And I love you You are my king And I worship you Kneeling before you now All of my life I gladly give to you Placing my hopes and dreams In your hands I give my heart to you And I love Yes, I love you, I love you, Jesus, my King. You are my King, and I love you. my King And I worship You Kneeling before You now All of my life I gladly give to You Placing my hopes and dreams in your hands I give my heart to you and I love you I love you Jesus yes I love you I love you Jesus yes I love I love you, Jesus, my King. Yes, I love you, I love you, Jesus, my King. Hello, yes. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Julie. I'm one of the trustees, and I'm the community message person this morning. So, big welcome to everyone this morning, whether you're with us in person or online. So, the messages go out um, on the email every week, and I'm not just going to go through them. If you want to find out about them and you don't get the email, then speak to Carla, and she will add you to the list. So I'm just going to draw your attention to a couple of them. And the first is that we've got an alternative Halloween event. We've got our Dragon Quest. Sadly, I'm too old to go. Um, so <laughs> Jacob's going to come and tell us about it. Uh, don't worry, nobody's too old to go. You can come as a helper. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, I do need some helpers. No, um, we're, we're doing all right, we're doing all right. Uh, so we've got two Dragon Quest parties. Uh, one is for primary school age, the other's for secondary school age. Some of the secondary school lot have already asked if they can come to the primary school lot as leaders. Um, so we might need a couple of other adults to help keep an eye on them. But... Um, <laughs> But it's going to be great fun. The primary school one, uh, there's lots of crafts and activities and games. Uh, and then there's a bit of a quest. They've got to go and uh, visit the wizard. Um, <laughs> then uh, the wizard will give them uh, the strength through a suite, of course, uh, to go and fight the dragon. Uh, they get to fight a dragon. Um, and then they can come back and uh, enjoy hot dogs and fizzy drinks and everything that will hype them up to go home. 
Um, then uh, the if teenagers will be here. I was just thinking, you know, I wonder if anyone type casting. You know, Julie was looking for a role, so I mean, what's... <laughs> it's, what? oh. no. Fortunately, the dragons are already done. Uh, they're made of wood, not, not people. Um, <laughs> Uh, the teenagers, uh, they're going to do a murder mystery. They've got to try and work out who's trying to kill the king. Um, I hope they work it out because I'm playing the king. So um, It would be uh, yeah, ideal if they could work that out. Uh, so the primary school one is uh, 4.30 till 6. And the secondary school plus sixth form um, is 7 till 9. Uh, if you want to know more information, there's flyers uh, by the front door or you can come and grab me after the service. And if you'd love to be a helper... We would uh, love you to be there. Uh, everything's preset, so you just turn up and do a craft with kids. It's great fun. Uh, so, yeah, if you want to do that as well, then come speak to me. Thanks. And if you know someone, they don't have to come to the church. You can ask them to come, can't you, Jacob? It's not just for church people. It's for anybody. So, you know, if you know someone that you think would be good to come, then come. So, although I'm, I'm older, I was trying to, like, not use paper and everything, but the Wi-Fi in here is so bad I can't see the messages on my phone. So, <laughs> so I'm just going to do them from memory. <laughs> um, so we've got a special church meeting coming up on the 7th of November, um, which is a Thursday, and church meetings are really important, and they can be fun and exciting, and they're not all boring and business. So it's a, an opportunity to be involved in what's going on in the church, um, and there will be something, the reason it's called a special constitution is because there's, sorry, a special meeting is because we're going to be looking at the constitution and there will be more um, things coming about, out about that this week. We have to give a certain amount of notice and everything to be legal, which is what we're doing. Um, so, but it would be great if you could come and just join in what's going on. Um, this year we're going to be doing a Narnia theme for Christmas. Woo! <laughs> So some of you may have been here long enough to remember the other one that we had several years ago. And it was great, wasn't it? It, it was about 15 years ago, but it was really, really good. So Jamie's going to have to do better than the last one. Um, Can I say, actually, I'm, I'm looking for people to help out as different roles in the Narnia story. So, you know, there's all the different characters. We, we, what, some way of operating like the, the, the lion or making the lion. So if you've got any sort of thoughts about like puppetry or how to make these things work, or if you want to play a character, you know, like Lucy and Susan and Peter and Edmund and all that, if, if you could dress up with your sort of little, you know, thing, if you'd like to do that, that would be fabulous if you've got a bit Amdram. Now, when it comes to the White Witch, um, I thought rather than people volunteering, I thought it'd be rather fun if people nominated other people that they thought would make a good witch. I thought that could make quite, for quite an interesting couple of months, couldn't it? Husbands, particularly, if you want to point. You know. <laughs> That's it. I, I assume you've nominated yourself as the Lion of Aslan. <laughs> um, and the, we're going to have a nativity parade through the town again um, this year. But it'd be really good if Jamie didn't have to coordinate it this year and there was somebody that could um, think about coordinating it for our church, looking for volunteers, the things that we're going to be doing. So if you feel that's something that you could do, then have a chat with Jamie. So there are other things on the notices, like the worship and the prophecy and things like that. But, you know, we send them out by email so we don't have to stand up here and take a lot of time telling people. Um, so please do look at the email. Um, we're going to take the offering now. Um, if I could have a couple of volunteers to take the offering. And I'm just going to pray while we take the offering. Um, I was just, this morning when I came, I have to admit, I was feeling quite tired and speaking to some other people who are feeling quite tired. And, and then we sang that song, and God does not grow weary. I mean, what, how wonderful is that to think that God does never grow weary? He's never tired, and he's never tired of us. Um, so, Father, I want to thank you that, that you never tire of us and you never grow weary. I thank you that um, you just look upon us and you love us. And we just want to pray now for the money that we're collecting. And we want to pray that that would be a real blessing to our community. Um, whatever that looks like, that you will multiply it and that there will be fruit from it. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's continue to worship one more song before the kids go. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou kids go out that they will get a vision of you today that those who are teaching them and caring for them will look at will
will get a vision of you, that everything we do will flow from a vision of you, Lord. That we would lean not on our own understanding, Lord. That we would not be living our lives trying to um, keep the rules of the rule book. But Lord, we would live our lives captivated, captivated by the glimpse of the vision of you. Captivated by the beauty of you, Lord. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in eternal dance of love and joy. The joys of heaven, Lord. Grant heaven's joys to us this morning, Lord, and every day. In the name of Christ, amen. It's going to bless our youngsters as they go on out.
as we are this morning. And that can seem so counterintuitive. We live in a world of, of judgment and shame. We create enough of that for ourselves in our own internal dialogues, let alone what other people might lay upon us. But the promise to you this morning, the good news to you this morning, is that Jesus has done everything necessary for you to come as you are, just as you are. He has done what is necessary, not you. There is no standard that you need to meet. There is no pass mark that you need to pass. There is only grace. As Julie was praying earlier, there is, there is grace. There is more than enough grace. We're conscious that we, we stray and we wander. We get things wrong. We get hurt. We get broken. But the invitation, just like the, the son in the, in the parable of the prodigal son, the invitation is always just to come home. Just turn around and come home. We haven't sung this song for quite some time. It's, quite, it's an olden but golden. But it's very simple and I hope that you remember it or pick it up very quickly.
the Lord. Come, let us return unto the Lord. Come, let us return. Just while you're um, getting comfortable, um, and before I get myself set up, you might want to just turn to your neighbor, whoever's around you, say hello, and you can discuss this question. Off the top of your heads, do you think we are more of a New Testament people or an Old Testament people? Which, which seems more relevant to you, Old Testament people or New Testament people? Let them discuss or just say hello.
Preacher here, thanks, nice one. Okay, just hold your thoughts on that one. I'm going to share with you the words of Psalm 88. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I am overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You've taken, me from, you've taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord, every day. I, I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth, I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbour. Darkness is my closest friend. Thanks for coming. It's been lovely to see you all this morning. God bless you. Have a great week. So... Back to my question. I wonder if if you were thinking about um, that that question of, you know, more intuitively, if I say, are we we more of an Old Testament people and New Testament people? Does does one seem more relevant, more immediately apt to who we are, kind of our existence, our experience? I want to just quick show of hands. Who would have roughly said New Testament people? Who would have roughly said Old Testament people? And who would have been clever and said, well, it's both really? Yes, there you are. Clever clogs. You think you're clever, you're not. Um, and of course, I think there's, there's, there's something to be said about, you know, we're a New Testament people. Yes, in many, many ways, we are shaped ultimately and absolutely by the life of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, and the, res- uh, and the reflections upon that that we discover in the New Testament. As I've been sharing over the last couple of weeks, we are, we are fundamentally shaped by his kingdom announcement. You know, that's what he's announcing. That's what's new. That's what's fresh. That's, that's the kind of focus and purpose and kind of trajectory of what he's declaring. But in terms of the experience of the people who wrote the New Testament, there's actually quite a fundamental difference, I want to suggest to you. You see, the the New Testament writers, in the most part, seemed to expect Jesus' imminent return. That's why we get these these, these passages where people are saying, well, you know, maybe maybe don't do anything too rash at the moment, maybe don't move away, maybe don't get married, maybe don't do this, maybe don't do that, you know, because Jesus is going to be coming back soon. So it's kind, kind of maybe just... Just hold it down for a little while, keep it tight for a bit, and then, and then we'll see. And, and actually, perhaps one of the reasons that we see this kind of explosion of, of Scripture writing in, in terms of written word at the end of the first century is, is because that first generation who believed that are passing away. The people who were actually there that saw these things, that saw the acts of Jesus, that, that saw the acts of the apostles and, and, and could, could tell you the stories, they could, they could tell you from their oral testimony, those people are passing away, those people are dying, and so the Jesus community is writing these stuff down, this stuff down because otherwise the stories will be lost. And that's why you get this explosion of scripture writing towards the end and the beginning of the, of the, of the first and second centuries. Um, 
I think if you were to ha- get in a time machine and pop back and speak to the Apostle Paul and say, hello, hello, I'm, I'm Jamie, you know, I'm from 2,000 years in the... Well, you wouldn't say I'm Jamie, that would be weird. You would insert your name there, otherwise it would just be confusing. You say, hello, I'm whoever I am, and I, I, I'm from 2,000 years in the future. I'm from the year 2024, and Jesus still hasn't come back. I think if you said that to Paul, Paul would be surprised. He would, oh, that wasn't the expectation. The expectation of the community was that Jesus' return would be within the next couple of years. And so that gives a little bit of context to my question, why I asked about the New Testament and Old Testament paradigms. Because in many ways, one of my favourite um, Old Testament scholars is a guy called P. Enns. And this is, I stole this from him. He, he says, because he teaches Old Testament, so of course, you know, first, first lesson of the first semester of the year, you get all these undergraduates sitting there, and he's got to kind of sell them and why, why the Old Testament is, is particularly relevant. And his point is, look at the experience of those people. Those people who lived in long obedience over, not decades, but over hundreds of and hundreds, possibly even thousand plus years of, of, of long obedience in the same direction, to use that expression. You know, that's actually, in some ways, in terms of an experience, the Old Testament experience is kind of similar to our own. You know, 2,000 years later, we've, we're on this trajectory, unlike the expectations of the New Testament early community. It changes as it goes on, and you get later writers and reflections. But that early community... You know, that wasn't their expectation that this would be a long period of, of, of faithful obedience, this long walk, the different experience, experiences that, that that suggests, you know, highs and lows, trials and tribulations. We, very much like the ancient Hebrews, when they reflect, or, or, or the people of Je- uh, Jesus' era even, they could look upon their long history and they could see the highs. They could see, you know, the, the kingdom, the great kingdom of David and Solomon, you know, when, when they were at their most powerful, most influential. In the same way that they could look back to those golden age, a- ages, perhaps we find ourselves looking back to golden ages, you know, times when the church had real influence. It was, it was powerful. It was shaping society, shaping culture. Or personally, we might look back to better days, good times, days of success, days of prosperity, days of health, you know, positive uh, in relationships, good things happening in our spiritual growth, sense of certainty and sureness and direction. And, you know, we look back to those golden ages, golden days. And alongside this, the Hebrews, as I started to share earlier, they also had the real depths that they could reflect upon. The hard times, the times in the desert, literally and metaphorically, of wandering, of uncertainty, of compromises, of of distortions and complacency that power brings. You know, those times when you are on top, it's not necessarily a bed of roses. It creates distortions and complacency. It it creates um, other problems. The times of disappointment, the times of betrayal, and particularly what I want to talk about today, this motif of exile. Exile, which is why it was up on the board, and that's kind of my title. And likewise, as the church, we might reflect on the more difficult times. As the church, being more marginalised, having less of a of a voice, having less of a kind of position in society. You know, in some ways, the church, as it finds itself today, kind of lurching between, well, you know, do we go forward or do we go backwards? Do we we try and evolve into the new thing or do do we try and hold on to what's past and seems to be slipping through our fingers? Or personally, again, we might reflect on the more challenging times, the times of failure, of suffering, of loss and lostness. Problems with health, with relationships, with spiritual stagnation, the opposite end of the spectrum. Times of uncertainty, times when you just feel like you're in a bit of a, a desert. Excuse me, just have a drink. So I think the, the Old Testament, as it's sometimes called, or the, or the Hebrew scriptures, perhaps a better expression, it has some amazing treasures for us. It's, it's a wonderful resource. It's a little bit harder to get your teeth into. But if you persevere and if you kind of come at it with a little bit of study and reflection and don't try to, like trying to eat a cow, it's better done sort of one bite at a time. If you try and get it all in in one go. Right, that was a joke. Your faces are incredibly stony. 
Or you just think about eating a cow, you think, oh, I'm really hungry, yeah, when's lunchtime? <laughs> oh, I could eat a cow. Or if you're a vegetarian, think of the vegetarian alternative. <laughs> Trying to eat a very large vegetable. I can't think of one. Pumpkin, a marrow, yeah. Um, <laughs> so the Hebrew Scriptures are such a treasure for us. Alongside the kind of heady, almost like frothy effervescence that we get in the New Testament, this kind of explosive experience. This thing has happened and Jesus is here and he seems to be the Messiah, and, but now he's dead, but now he's alive and what the heck is going on? And the message is spreading out and now apparently the Gentiles are interested, but the Je Jews are perhaps not so interested. You've got all this incredible uncertainty and it makes for this really sort of heady, frothy kind of brew. Alongside that, we also have in the Old Testament something more sustained, more reflective, more kind of shaped, kind of a, a bit smoother, shaped not by a few years or decades or months, but shaped by, by centuries, shaped by long experience and different reflections. There's such a breadth of experience in the Old Testament. And it's all boiled down in the Psalms, which is why I recommended that you read a Psalm a day. It's just such a, a really helpful thing to do. Because in that you get the amazing heights. Everything's great and I'm so happy. And Lord, shall we strike them down full of power, full of victory? And then you get Psalm 88, which we started with. Like, oh dear. It's all in there. Today, part of this kind of mini-series we're doing all around the idea of, of caring community, I want to reflect on this phenomenon, you might call it, of exile that hangs over the whole of, of the Hebrew Scriptures. And I'm, I'm, today I'm, I'm thinking more about the experience of it rather than just you know, the lesson or the story or what you can draw out, more, more of the experience of it, more the kind of lived, something more existential, you know. Um, and as I say, I think this, this motif of exile hangs over the Scripture. If you do any kind of study into the, the composition of the Old Testament, you'll know that, incidentally, the, the period of exile was when um, the city of Jer Jerusalem was finally conquered. The kingdom of Judah was finally conquered. And loads of people were carted off. Perhaps the majority of particularly the ruling elites and that were carted off, and other people as well. Anyone who had any talents that the Babylonians wanted, carted off to exile in um, Babylon and it happened over, it didn't happen immediately, it happened over successive about three stages if memory serves. Um, but eventually they were all in this place of exile and Jerusalem was torn down, the temple was torn down. It was an absolute disaster. And while they were in Babylon, most scholars, not all, but most scholars would concur that the majority of scripture as we have it today was kind of either composed or edited, put together from other accounts in the Babylonian exile. So exile kind of hangs over the whole, even though the story of the exile is only in, in bits of the Bible. You know, you'll, you'll see it in books like um, Daniel and Nehemiah and Ezra and you'll have reference to it in the prophets and that sort of thing. Although the story is only part of the Bible, the kind of influence it has is over the whole thing because that was where, for example, the, the Torah was probably put together and that sort of thing. So it's got this very strong influence. And I think just to get inside of that, you've got to understand the trauma of, of, of what that would have meant. You are, the, you are the Hebrew people, you are the Jewish people later on in, in the kingdom of Judah after the northern kingdom was, was also conquered. You know that you worship the creator God. You know that you worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You know that your God is above all other gods and all other gods are simply idols or illusions or demons. You know, you know this, you have this strength. You know you worship. And then in the temple in Jerusalem, that's where he dwells. That is his, his resting place on earth. That is where the Shekinah glory fell. This is, this is your God. And suddenly, and, and bear in mind in those days, um, when nations went to war, it was seen as very much as a war between their gods. Who's got the strongest god, you know? If, if, if your god is stronger than our god, then your god will give you victory, won't he? Stands to reason. But if our god is stronger, then he'll give us victory. That stands to reason too. And that's exactly what the Babylonians would have felt and exactly what the Jewish people couldn't have helped but felt. Here had come the, the Babylonians under all their panoply of gods, and they had defeated them. They had conquered Jerusalem. They had torn down the temple. I mean, what an insult. They had desecrated it. They had torn down the walls of Jerusalem and carted these people off, driven them into exile in Babylon. 
Imagine walking under the Asheron Gate, the dedicated to the goddess of, uh, of, of Babylon, walking through there, and everything around you reminding you that you are a defeated people, that your God has not come up trumps, that you are, that you are broken, you are enslaved, you do exactly what we say when we say, when we say jump, you say how high, or you'll be in serious problems. You know, the royal family were mutilated. You know, th- this, is, this is a disaster. Imagine if you can, and perhaps some of you can, an event which turns your world upside down. And even worse than that, shatters your world. And this is a phenomenon that psychologists describe, but from, from their interaction with their clients, it's apparently quite a common, a common way to describe it, the sense of just falling. Everyone ever had that? You're in a moment of your world being utterly shattered and you are just falling and falling and there's just nowhere to grab onto. You can't slow your descent and you, there's no marks of orientation. There are no landmarks. Your world is just this spinning soup of, of, of lostness. That's the experience. That's the trauma of exile. We have this snapshot And as I read this snapshot to you, two things. First of all, try not to be singing Boney M, because that is going to be in your head. By the rivers of Bath. That's where we're going. So let's just get get that out. Just just sweep that away. We've done that now. You don't have to let that distract you. And I will will also warn you, there's a content warning on this. This this, um, psalm ends with a really, really violent disturbing image of, of, of violence towards a child. So if you find that difficult, then I'll warn you when we get to that bit, shut your eyes, put your hands over your ears. But I'm going to read it to you because it's in the Bible and we can't exist on this kind of sanitised, watered-down, expurgated version of Scripture. Okay, so here we are. By the rivers of Babylon. Remember, they've just come out of exile. They've been marched across the desert. They get there. There we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion, the place of Jerusalem. On the willows there, we hung up our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. You can imagine them saying, come on, sing us a song. Sing us one of your songs. Come on, give us a good laugh. And they, these are the songs of the temple. These are the songs of God. So they hung up their harps. We're not going to play. We're not going to sing you our songs. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy, remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down. So this is this other people who were on the sidelines, rubbing their hands in glee as the Babylonians captured Jerusalem. Yeah, tear it down. We've wanted to get one over on them. And the exiles remembering the shame and the hatred they felt towards those neighbouring people who had such glee over their downfall. Remember that, Lord. Remember what they did. And then here comes this image, so shut your eyes, stuck your fingers in your ears if you don't want to hear this. O daughter Babylon, you devastator, happy shall they be who pay you back for what you've done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. Because that was something that they had seen. That had happened to their little ones and they're saying, yeah, Happy will be those who pay you back in the same way. Do that to your children. I just want you to reflect on this. Reflect on the feeling of it. The the emotion, the experience that is revealed in these lines. The sense of grief. It's like being shell-shocked, isn't it? It's like that sense of utter shell-shock. The sense of being traumatised. This PTSD, isn't it? It, it, It's the desire for revenge, it's so visceral, isn't it? Yeah, we want to see them paid back the same way that we. We want them to get a taste of the medicine that they gave us. We want revenge. We want blood. We want them to be experiencing the pain 
that we're experiencing. It's, it's so savage. It's so human. Cast your mind back to what I started with, with um, Psalm 88. The sense of total desolation, of crying out to God in despair. Who, who didn't resonate? Don't put your hand up. But, you know, when, when I read those lines, who didn't resonate with some of those lines, some of those experiences, that sense of crying out to God in the moment of your deepest, darkestness or, or, or desperation? We could turn to all different sorts of places in the Old Testament. You know, read Ecclesiastes. I love Ecclesiastes. It's not necessarily a light read or a fun read, but it it has this sense of real world weariness, a sense of futility. You could argue even a sense of depression that the teacher kind of puts across. It's a different sense. And, you know, if you want to read more, that you, so many of the Psalms, like I said earlier, the Book of Lamentations, which is a kind of a sustained reflection upon this experience of, of exile. It's so, it's heartbreaking. I mean, the Book of Lamentations, it's heartbreaking. But it's also kind of beautiful in some ways. Some of the imagery, it's so, oh, it gets you right there. It's some of the greatest poetry that's perhaps ever been composed, coming out of this place of just intense grief. And there are, of course, these endless connections between suffering and creativity. Now, my point today is a simple one. And my point is certainly not to dive in to the specific uh, circumstances of all that content. I'm not going to go through every instance of suffering in the Bible and try and explain it or or give it some, some context even. My point is very, very simple. It's not deep. It's not profound, it's simple, and it's this. No one felt the need to cut any of this out of the Bible. No one thought that we had to airbrush that out. A bit of kind of, you know, ancient Photoshop. You know, let's just airbrush that out. Let's, let's cut that away. Oh, that's not going to preach well on a Sunday morning. Let's get rid of Psalm 88. You know, people come in, hard days work, they want something a bit uplifting. We can't have Psalm 88 in there, let's get rid of that. Let's not have talk about things being done to children in the Babylonian exile. Let's not have, it's a bit dark, isn't it? It's a bit, you know, R-rated. Let's, let's get rid of that. No one felt that he, let's not, I mean, God, what's going on in Ecclesiastes? For goodness sake, that guy needs to cheer up. For goodness sake. Let's get rid of that. That's all a bit embarrassing, isn't it? He seems to be... His, Slightly um, kind of postmodern in his thinking, slightly off the charts. Let's get rid of that. No, no one felt the need. No one, in fact, opposite, they made pains. They went to great effort to keep this stuff in our Bible. They said all of this is important. We need all of this. We need the whole picture, the whole story. How often in your lives do you feel the need to edit out? The ugly bits, the difficult bits, the painful bits. How are you? Oh, fine. You know, that's the most obvious example. And sometimes there is reason for that. It's like, how long have you got? But how often do we feel the need to, to dress it up? There's this phenomenon of the people who, who spend most time on social media get more depressed. Because social media is, is uh, on social media, there are so many images of everyone else having a brilliant life. All the meals. Why do people take pictures of their meals? We do that. It's weird, isn't it? But... <laughs> You never, take, you never take a picture of the meal that you burnt, though, did you? Or, or, you know, this is, here's my holiday shot with me. So I, I took 15 before I looked good. This is the good one that I posted. I'm not looking at anyone in particular. Um, <laughs> I'm going to get in real trouble later. Um, <laughs> every time I take a picture of me and Joe, she's like, right, no, no, delete, no, delete, no, delete. Right, that one you can keep. <laughs> true isn't it but we 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 go through life and it's fair enough of course it's but if you want to have nice pictures nice memories that sort of thing but we go through life editing out the difficult stuff we find it hard to talk about our struggles we find it hard to talk about the areas of life where we feel weak and broken and poor and we've gone through the valley of shadow as I, I shared in a message over the summer called God forsaken if you want to go more into this go go back to that one we assume that we are God forsaken when everything is going wrong and that we are blessed when everything is going right. It's actually the exact opposite. 
In terms of what God says in his word, he says, no, I'm with you in the morning. I'm with you in the time of struggling. I am revealed as a man hanging on a cross. You can't get any more suffering than that. That's where I am. So often we're tempted to draw out the kind of moral lesson of Scripture, scripture and, and, and rightly so, understandably so, that can be useful. We might take you know, one verse or a few verses and derive some explanation from it or out of it, you know, particularly perhaps to do with suffering. I've spoken about that before. But I want to say to you today, I think sometimes the lesson is not simply in the ideas of Scripture that we might take from it, but in the experience of Scripture. The human emotions, the feelings, the experiences that are related to us in the Bible and the sheer variety of ways in which these are presented and also wrestled with. This is a book of human beings wrestling with all the stuff that we wrestle with. It's not in large part, perhaps in part it is, but it's not in, I would argue, in the main, a book of moral lessons that you just, you know, take that, turn, open your Bible, read the lesson, read that off. Okay, the Bible says it, I believe it, let's do it, bang. That can work at times, but if that is your lens for understanding all of Scripture, I suggest you're not reading all of Scripture, because you can't read all of Scripture that way. We're reading selectively. We're reading the bits that suit us to read in that way. This is our lives. This is our story. The Bible shows us that suffering is normal. The sense of brokenness is normal. The sense of lostness is normal. The feeling of exile is normal. And sometimes, yes, we can say we've, we've brought it on ourselves. We have made mistakes. We've done foolish things. We've done sinful things. And we've made our situation worse. But even then, as, I insert, as a good evangelical, yes, you might have sinned and brought it on yourself. But even then, broken people do broken things. Hurt people hurt people. Where do you trace it back to? Where do you wind the clock back to, to to point the blame? The beauty of the cross is that Jesus says, you don't need to do that because I open up my arms and I absorb all of it. Very often we're at the mercy of forces over which we have no control, just like those people carted off into exile, just like those children. We haven't done anything wrong. God didn't drop the ball either. For some reason, this is the human experience. I've spoken about this a few times in recent weeks, about how we kind of get our heads around suffering. As a caring community, we deal with the world as we actually find it. Find it. I love the Bible because the Bible tells me about the world as I see it, not as I have to pretend that it is if you read all of it. We, as a caring community, will, as I've been sharing in the last couple of weeks, we're going to cling to the story of hope. That is our story. We are going to look to the coming kingdom. We're going to believe and we're going to work towards and we are going to take up the power of love in what we do to bring transformation and healing and wholeness. But we, at the same time, we don't forget, as we are doing all those wonderful things, we don't forget where we are or when we are. That's the difference, and who doesn't love a big theological word? That's the difference between realised eschatology and inaugurated eschatology. I don't think I need to explain that anymore, do I? So eschatology means the eschaton, where we're going to end up, what God is bringing in. And you might have heard preaching where, God, where, where people will say things like, well, you know, God doesn't want disease. There's no disease in heaven, so we're going to pray and all that disease is going to leave because what God wants is what God wants. Makes sense, doesn't it? God's all-powerful, so we're going to pray and what we're going to see is exactly what God wants. And it's logical. It makes perfect sense. And then if it doesn't happen, well, we have to find something else to blame. Well, you didn't have enough faith or they didn't have enough faith or you didn't use the right pr prayer. You didn't say verily or beseech. God really likes it when you say beseech because he talks like a 16th century English person. So, you know, we've got to find some other reason. That's realised eschatology. We're imagining that the future that God has is realised. It's now. It's happened. It's, 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 it's our reality. And it makes perfect sense. It's kind of logical. It's just not biblical. Because the Bible speaks about the first fruits of what Jesus has done. It talks about the planting of a seed 
And it promises that the fulfillment, that the, that the consummation of this is when Jesus comes again. So now we live in a moment where that eschaton, that eschatology, is inaugurated. It started. We're on the way there, but it's not here now. Right here and right now, we still live in a battleground. Now, we know who has the victory, but the battle is still around us. It's worth bearing this in mind as we care for one another. We're not called to be rushing in and fixing people because it's all got to be perfect now. They've got to be fixed. They've got to be right. We can't have any problems. We don't rush in as fixes. We don't rush in and think that we should, in our own strength, solve every problem. We don't try to rush in to explain away suffering either, as I've shared. Oh, well, the reason that's happened is because of this. Someone didn't pray hard enough or someone else sinned or what have you. Or There's loads, I mean, I've preached about this loads. You, there's loads of places you can go to illustrate this from Scripture. We're not rushing in to fix. We're not rushing in to explain away. We're not rushing in to solve every problem in our own strength. When we care for one another, get this, if you don't get anything else, get this, we are expressing solidarity for our brothers and sisters. That means we are standing together. I think one of the most beautiful things when you care for someone is just simply to stand with them. Sometimes you can't. We, were t- we had a, prayer, um, a pastoral meeting this week. We were talking about some of the difficult situations that we encounter. And sometimes our prayer is simply, Lord, have mercy. Because there's nothing more eloquent, is there? Beautiful words aren't going to change this situation. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Just crying out. We sit in that place like the psalmist, just crying out. Standing with. And I know some of you, Some of you have been through and are going through really difficult situations right now. And if you if you haven't been through them and you're you're not going through them, you probably will at some point. Not not laying that on you, but it's just reality. You are in places where there are no neat answers, and maybe there is no fixing of it. Well, not this side of Jesus coming back anyway. We care. As a community, we care for where you are. We want, if, we, if we possibly can, we want to help you. Of course, if we can help you, we want to help you. But most of all, when we care for one another, we see one another. We see you. We can't fix it. I can't give you easy answers necessarily. This side of Jesus coming back. But we see you. We stand with you. We're with you. We love you. And... I don't know about you, but in the darkest moments of my life, someone just being with you, that can make all the difference, can't it? Someone standing with you. They can't wave a magic wand. They can't solve it all. But just someone being with you, saying, I see you, I'm with you, I care for you, makes all the difference, doesn't it? It's beautiful. And actually, isn't that exactly what God promises in Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of evil, shadow of death, depending on translation, you are with me. You are with me. Not you are a helicopter who lifts me out of the shallow valley of shadow. No, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And it goes on. We sung this earlier, and I'm going to end with this. So if musicians want to start getting themselves plugged in, The words of Hosea 6, 1 to 3, Come, let us return to the Lord, for it is he who has torn us, and he will heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. Get this, after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His appearing is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us like showers, like the spring rains that water the earth. And once again, my intention in sharing that with you is not to give you some sort of easy explanation of where suffering comes from. It's to point you to that wonderful line. After three days, on the third day, we will live again. Now that must be pointing towards the cross. That's what we have. That's who we have. We have Jesus on the cross in the moment of profoundest suffering, promising resurrection life. New life, new hope. 
beyond the place of death. I'm just going to hand over to someone who's going to pray, who's looking at each other. Thanks, Jimmy. An amazing picture of a God who just sits with us wherever we are, whether that's in our joy or in our suffering. We were joking before the service that for Ian that God knows the number of hairs on your head. (laughs) But isn't that amazing that God knows us so well that he knows the number of hairs on our head, that he cares about every single part of us and he doesn't always just want us to lift ourselves up and be joyful but he wants to sit with us in our suffering and wherever we are so I'm just going to pray Father I want to thank you that you meet us where we are you don't expect us to move to where you are because you're already there I thank you for each one of us that whatever we're going through, whether it be joy or suffering or whether we're in the pits or on the heights, that you're there with us, that we can sit at your feet, in your arms, and that you just care about us. You don't judge us. You don't tell us that we're where we are because it's our own fault. But you just accept us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the glory die my richest gain I count but loss and poor content on all my Sorrow and 
also Lord this wonderful mystery that demanded your life in which you poured your life out for us means that we have life we have hope in the same way that you went through death and came out the other side we too when we are confronted by death both death as a big thing as our mortal lives, but also all the little deaths, the valleys of shadow that, that punctuate our lives. Lord, we have this same hope mm -hmm. that there is life beyond every single grave. There is an Easter morning beyond every Good Friday. There is resurrection beyond death. Lord, this is good news. It demands my soul, my life, my all. Lord, because you gave your soul, your life, your all, your everything, Lord. Mm -hmm. And as we go out into this week and give our whole to you, Lord, may we be filled with your all to spread and share the life that we have received, the fullness to abundant overflowing that you have given. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is king yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Um, there will be some folks at the front if there are particular issues that you'd like to pray into or pray over. There will be coffee and tea out the back as well if you would like to uh, partake. God bless you. Have a great week. <laughs>